If you're wondering how you can keep your wholesaling business making money during a recession, this video is for you because I'll be showing you some tips on how you should run your wholesaling business during a shifting market. Let's get into it. So now, since we're shifting more into a buyer's market, my first tip for you is to call each of your buyers. You need to verify that your buyers are still currently buying in the area because if they're not, you need to go and find more buyers. But if they are, you need to make sure that you have their buying criteria and you need to make sure that you have their price points so you won't be sending them properties that they will not be interested in. But like I said, there's going to be a lot of buyers when we go into a shifting market will not be buying at this current time. My number two tip is you should always be building a buyer's list, a bigger buyer's list. If you do run into some of your buyers that say, I'm not buying right now, I just very uncertain about the market. I'm just going to hold out for now. There still are buyers that will be buying. My number one way to find new buyers is to go to your county courthouse. If you go look in the foreclosure booklet, which I'm getting ready to put on the screen now, you will see that on this particular form, this buyer actually put in a bid on this property and they even showed you the price point that they bid at, that they're willing to pay for it. So that's another gem if you go after that particular property as a foreclosure. But that lets you know that this buyer is actively buying. So you don't have to figure out if they're buying or not because they still are putting money out into the market. There are gonna be a lot of files on these buyers at the courthouse. And the good part about it, you won't have to skip trace, you won't have to guess and see what the phone numbers are because the phone numbers will actually be on the document as well too. So that's another way once you see that half of your buyers on your buyers list have currently stopped buying, you can go to the courthouse and you can pull this document up. You'll be able to do that and you'll be able to create a bigger buyers list and see who's buying in this shifting market. If you enjoying the content so far, just do me a favor, hit the like button, subscribe and click the notification bell. And that may even help YouTube push this video out to a larger audience so we can get everybody the help that they need if they're trying to get started in wholesaling. And that also just shows that you appreciate the content that I'm providing to you. Let's get back into the video. Now, my next tip is to look for more hedge fund buyers. You may have hedge funds that's going to pull out of the market as well, too. But I'm going to actually jump into my computer in a few seconds, and I'm going to show you how you can research hedge fund buyers. Not only will they buy more properties from you, but they'll be willing to pay more than what a regular flipper would actually pay for a property in most cases. So let's dive into my computer for a few minutes and let me show you how you can find hedge funds to sell your deals to. All right, so now that we are in my computer, I am inside a prop stream. I don't know if you have prop stream or not. If you don't, you can get a free trial for seven days if you want to try it out. The link is in my bio, but I just want to show you how you can find hedge funds buyers. So if you're wondering what a hedge fund buyer is, a hedge fund buyer is someone that owns pretty much a lot of properties and they have a lot of cash that they're looking to disperse out into the market. And then most of the time they're willing to pay more than what someone that is just flipping individual houses would be willing to pay. So that's why you would want to go after hedge fund buyers. So what we're going to do, I'm going to type in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, and I'm going to go up to filters. And then owner occupied, no. The occupancy status really doesn't matter. Property characteristics, we're going to go single family, condo slash townhomes, multifamily, two to four. Because those are the type of buyers that you're going to be looking for because those are the type of properties you're going after. We're going to go to MLS status. We're going to go to sold. And then for MLS status date, we're going to go back a couple of years. Let's do 2019. So I went back to 2019, back to August 2019. And then we're just going to choose today's date. Then we're going to go to ownership info, owner type. It's going to be corporate minimum number of properties. We're going to do 15. And from there, we're going to close it out. So we're going to look at the first property and we're going to see would this potentially be a hedge fund buyer? Let's see how much properties they own. Definitely, this is a hedge fund buyer. You see they own 65,888 properties. But the good thing about it, they bought in Mecklenburg County, so that lets you know that it will be interested in purchasing in this particular area. So what I normally do is I normally go to MLS details, and I want to see who's listing the property. So the agent name is here, and the office number is here. So most of the time, this is going to be a good starting point because since the property sold to this particular LLC, of course, the agent is going to know who this person is. So you can reach out to the agent 
If the agent is willing to give you that information, then you can reach out to the hedge fund. But if the agent isn't willing to give you that information, you don't stop there. You can just take this LLC name. You see it's currently a PO box that the mailing address is registered to, but it's in Scottsdale, Arizona. So what I would do, I will go type in open corporates. I will put the LLC name in. As you can see, we have a seven points here in North Carolina. We have one in Indiana. So obviously they have a bunch of different branches, but the main one that I would be looking at is this one here in Arizona. And as you can see, the, it really isn't an agent name there. So your best option is to talk to the realtor. But you can dig deeper into this by just searching on the internet to find out who the actual owner may be and if they will be interested in buying more property in the area. Most of the time, they're going to be interested in buying more property. You just got to do the front end work to get in contact with them. But that is a way that you can find hedge fund buyers. I mentioned it in my videos before. But this is more in depth to show you how to handle this type of situation doing a shift in market such as a buyer's market. Now, my next tip is you may have to make adjustments to the 70% rule. I know over the past few years you may have been wholesaling at 75 or 80, 85%. Now, it may be even lower than 70% that you'll be able to wholesale if you're going to be wholesaling to individual buyers in the area. So now you may actually have to wholesale at 60 to 65 percent. And what I did, I just put an example together to show you what your difference in price would be on a property that needed thirty thousand dollars in work just basing off of making that adjustment to 65 percent. So let's get into the example. Let's say you have a property that's worth two hundred and thirty thousand in tip top condition. So that's your ARV. If you multiply that by 70 percent, that would give you a total of $161,000. If you subtract your repairs, like I said before, which is $30,000, that means you will be able to sell this particular property at $131,000. Now, not only that, you have to subtract your assignment fee. So let's say you wanted to make $10,000. So now your max allowable offer would be $121,000. And to give yourself some wiggle room for negotiation, you need to subtract another 10% from that price, which would be $12,100. So your starting offer would actually be $100,000. $8,900. Now, that's what us using the 70% rule over the past few years while we were in the seller's market. And like I said, it may have been higher than that. Now, in a shifting market, $108,000 would not be your starting offer. Let's go into the example where you're actually using 65% instead of 70%. So you have the same after repair value of 230,000, which that means that's what the property can sell for in tip top condition. You multiply that by 65%, that would equal to 149,500. Then you subtract the repairs, which would be $30,000. You will be able to sell a property for $119,500. If you still wanna make that same 10,000, you gotta subtract the 10,000 from that number. So your max allowable offer would be $109,500. Then you subtract another $10,950 which is subtracting 10% from your max allowable offer, your starting offer would be $98,550. So as you can see, that is a $10,000 difference compared to us using the 70% rule in a seller's market. This is your starting offer when we're in a buyer's market. Now, take that with a grain of salt. Of course, you gotta do a little bit more research. You gotta make sure that that's your ARV you got to make sure that 65% would actually work. It may be 60%. You just never know. You just have to make that adjustment as you go and as you research your market to see what properties are going for. So my next tip that I want to give you is pay attention to the soul comps in your area. Now, going into this buyer's market, you may notice now that properties that are selling now may be selling for less than what properties sold for six months ago. So that lets you know that the sold comps six months ago wouldn't be the comps that you can use to come up with your offer on your properties. So my number one thing to do in a situation like this is please pay attention to the pending and contingent properties in the area because that not only lets you know what's going on currently in the market, but that'll let you know where the market is going. So if you see a property that is selling for $100,000 now, 
but a few months ago or six months ago, that same type of property in that area sold for $300,000. That lets you know that the market is definitely shifting and that you need to be making adjustments to the type of offers that you'll be making to your sellers. So just to show you how I find my pending properties when it come down to a property that I'm looking at, I'm gonna hop into my computer for a few minutes and show you how that can actually be done. So now as you can see, this is just a random property that I found. There's no property in particular or anything that I chose. But if you take a look at it, whenever you go through the process of comp in a property, being in the shifting market, going back a whole year would not work. So now, only thing I'm gonna do is change this to pending. So this is the pending option. And it's gonna show you the property that's pending. So this particular property, Let's say that it needs work, and let's say that the property is in this property's condition right here. We know now that if this particular property is in this property's condition, then we know that it can sell for $189,500, and that's the pending sale. Of course, it hasn't closed yet, but it gives you an idea of where the market is actually going. Now, you can also come up here and do contingent sales as well, too, and you see there's not any in that particular area. But that that's just giving you a better idea of where the market is going instead of depending on these sole comps here in the area. I just wanted to show you where you can find the pendant and contingent checkbox so you can see what is pending in the area. So my question of the day for you is, have you noticed a change in your market? And if you have, what are you doing to make sure that your wholesaling business remains on top? Leave a comment down below letting me know. And if you enjoy this content, please feel free to check out my wholesaling playlist here. And I'll see you next time.